Stream. Okay, Starting stream. You are live, you are live. Good morning, everybody, or possibly good afternoon and good evening. It's Lauren un under the water here, your underwater biologist. We have Emil on camera and we have Pat up on the surface as your surface biologist. So currently I am at 12 meters at the famous Casarina Point. This is just in front of Don Foster's on the western side of Grand Cayman. But instead of going to the right, we have actually gone to the left. So it is a slightly different area, so we don't know what we're going to see. But before we go diving, there is one important thing to say. Today is the International Day for the Conservation of Mangroves Ecosystem. So while I'm going to swim over this coral to get looking for exciting things, Pat is going to tell you all about mangroves and just how important they are. So over to you, Pat. Yeah, welcome everybody and happy International Mangrove Conservation Day. I think I got that right. No, you didn't, but never mind. <laughs> so... So yeah, so mangroves are super important in our in our eco in our respective ecosystems, should I say? And they're also important globally. So one major thing of uh, mangroves that they do is that they actually absorb carbon dioxide. And uh, rising carbon dioxide levels are becoming such a problem for the world's oceans. Now they also will uh, stop flooding and coastal erosion by acting as a bit of a buffer between the shoreline and the land. And they are also super important in harbouring organisms. Just about every type of animal that we get on this coral reef, we also get in just as high numbers, not the corals themselves, but other attached organisms and smaller juvenile fish, and even larger fish, even angelfish we actually get in the mangroves. So once you take a look under the surface, you really start to get an idea for just how important these ecosystems are. Yeah, they often get overlooked. A lot of people don't sort of pay attention to them. And unfortunately, the ecosystems themselves are critically endangered. They are being destroyed all around the world. And believe it or not, the Dive Live team's house, we have a little house, does look straight onto the mangroves. And we have gone diving and swimming there on numerous occasions. So for all the reasons that Pat mentioned, mangroves are super important and they must be protected all around the world. So if there is any mangrove questions that you may have, please send them in or any questions about what Lauren is doing or seeing today. And if you're on Twitter, you're using that hashtag dive live. Yes, this is our third last day of broadcasting for phase one, don't worry. So we need to make sure these dives are super awesome and that we do get run to answer in your questions as much as we can and as long as they're relevant to the dive. So not only is it mangrove conservation day, it is shark week. So unfortunately we don't see many sharks around here. But no sharks can be seen, particularly in this area, which is why we came to the left. So you never know, fingers crossed, I really am hoping to see a nurse shark in honour of Shark Week. Yes, well this left hand side is uh, where a lot of nurse sharks have been spotted in the past, so hopefully this is no exception today. Yeah, so what would you like to see today, Pat? Uh, well, I would like to see an eagle ray. We haven't got one of those for quite some time. And we have... Proud Cat Mama is asking for... Sorry. A golden hamlet. Oh, oh yes, that's exactly what I want to see too. Okay, on my list at the moment we have a loggerhead, an octopus and a golden hamlet. These are the three main things I want to show everybody before we finish up. So let's see, you never know. The visibility isn't amazing, but it's definitely better today, so we might catch sight of that eagle ray for you. 
Yeah, we would love a nice ray siding. They are actually related to sharks, so it would kind of fit in with Shark Week as well. Yeah, it would. Sharks and rays are super important and super closely related, so it definitely would fit in. So just while we're cruising the reef here, I just want to give a big shout out and thank you to Carrie Stettler, one of our amazing supporters who has supported us from the beginning and yesterday we received your beautiful package and we could not be more grateful so thank you so much Carrie for everything we were very happy to receive that yesterday so if you are watching from all of us at Dive Live thank you yeah we really do appreciate it we love our interactions with our loyal fans um, so Betty is asking, she's also asking for something really tricky and would like a seahorse and uh, Marcy would like a Christmas tree worm or a turtle. Oh, okay, that one is possible. Christmas tree worms are really common here, they're pretty much everywhere and turtles are pretty common too, so those ones are possible. So we have came down to the sandier patch, I'm at 14.5 metres to give you a sort of indication of where I'm at. And this is the common place where you will see stingrays or eagle rays. So we've came down here to have a look and let's see what we can find. There's hamlets are really common on this side of the reef as well. So I need to keep my eyes open for this golden hamlet. Yeah, this is one of the only hamlet species that we haven't come across yet. We've seen just about every one, which is actually really great because they are quite a diverse grouping and we actually have the butter hamlet right in front of us. Yeah, we have the butter hamlet, but it's not the one we want, is it? We want that golden one. But yeah, we have the butter hamlet. And you can actually see when you look at it front on just how thick and robust their lips actually are. So for a small kind of slender fish, you wouldn't expect such a big mouth, but they are related to sea basses, and all sea basses are categorised by those big, uh, robust jaws. Yeah, groupers are actually part of the sea bass family, so you can see how they link in because they definitely have big, strong jaws. So, Neil, we're just going to continue over this way. Keep looking. We did see Patch hanging out in these areas quite a lot. And it has been a while since we've actually sighted Patch, so that would be lovely to see him or her and know that she's doing well. Yeah, definitely. It's been quite some time. And it is. Would you say Patch is one of the youngest or smallest turtles we have in our database? Yeah, I would. We actually did sight a younger and smaller one, but once again, it was when the broadcast ended and we weren't able to get an ID. But on our sort of individual list, I would say that Patch is probably the smallest and the youngest. Jeez, the, the difficult requests keep coming in, so... <laughs> CJ's asking for a sea hare or a nudie brank. Oh, okay, yeah, but, yep. We don't tend to see them around this area too much, but there are other areas around here where we do see them. So I'll definitely keep my eye open for them. Yeah, I think if you could just get at least one of the things requested today, we'd all be very happy. <laughs> Some things are easy, some not so much. So let's see what we can do. We are just hovering really slowly over the reef now. And the slower we go, the more you can actually see. Some people like to swim really fast in the water and they end up sort of swimming over things without realizing it. Yeah, when you are diving, sometimes you've got to uh, stop and smell the roses, so to speak. <laughs> yes, that is exactly the one, Pat. <laughs> well, the reef is alive here for sure. 
There is a lot of life. A lot of fish activity. I always personally find the morning dive to be a lot more active because I feel like the reef is just wakening up. So it is 7 a.m. here in Grand Cayman. The sun is up, but everything's just sort of starting for the day, and I always feel there is a lot more activity happening then. Yeah, most definitely. It is kind of a crossover, so all of the animals that are nocturnal and uh, active during the night are kind of winding down or finding a place to rest, whereas all of the diurnal animals, the ones that are active during the day, are just kind of starting to wake up and, and get into their, their routine. <laughs> Emil is looking at here. I believe he has found the Christmas tree worm. So there ah, you go, Marcy. That is exact. Okay, at least we find one of the things. Yeah. So they are a favourite here, and they are very common around here. They're often just sort of sticking out of the coral and the rocks. So they're not too difficult for us to find. But if we were to go closer to that animal, which we obviously won't, we have the fantastic ability of a zoom lens. That animal would retreat into its little bunker and then cover itself with an operculum. So it will be completely hidden from our view and completely safe from predators. So if you're not sort of slow enough, you could easily miss these animals. And they are animals. They are part of the segmented worms grouping of animals, even although they just really don't look like it. So this one ahead is actually just one animal. You can just see two crowns. So it sort of gives the impression that there's two animals there, but there's not. Every Christmas tree worm has the two Christmas trees, if you like. And they're really fascinating. We do talk about them a lot purely because they are so fascinating. The Christmas tree that you can see, or the crown, or the pines, whatever you want to call it, is only one third of the animal. Two thirds of the animal remains hidden inside a bunker, which will be very narrow and very long, buried inside the coral or the rock. Now, a lot of people think this animal actually actively burrows, but it doesn't. Just when it's a very, very small larvae, it sort of rests and nestles against the coral. And over time, the polyps are forced to grow over it and around it. And that's how its bunker is actually formed. Not by the animal itself burying into the rock. Yeah, so it is quite a bit less invasive than others that we call boring organisms. Boring being that they will actually dig into the coral or the sponge or the rock to make their home. Yeah, so really, really fascinating. It just doesn't look like an animal. You could easily see how people would maybe mistake it for a plant or whatnot. So we're just going to head up a little bit shallower. We are at 15 metres. So we're just going to go a little bit shallower and see what we can find up there. So Betty, just in that last shot, was noticing that there was a lot of different colours and was just asking what they were. So they were just a mix of different corals, sponges and gorgonians. <laughs> yeah, in one sort of section of this reef you can see multiple amounts of organisms and life. Everything is growing on top of one another and fighting one another and competing for that space. So well spotted. So don't forget, if you do have any questions throughout this dive, please do send them in. And if you are on Twitter, use that hashtag dive live. But if you're using Facebook or YouTube, there's no need to because we're going to be seeing it anyway. Yeah, and we've only got a few days left to answer your amazing questions, or at least attempt to. So please do send them in if they relate to the ocean and coral reefs. Oh, and there's a cell shell here that's stuck in between the ropes 
sponge. Oh, wow. It's uh, very interesting. Yeah, it's very randomly <laughs> situated, if you like. I'm just going to have a little look underneath, because very often these shells are not what you think they are, and they can, in fact, just be a little hermit crab who has stolen or adopted the shell, if you like, and will walk about the ocean. I can't see anything. How random. Would you like me to try and identify this one, Lauren? Go for it, if you think you can. Yeah, I'll try. I can't see any sign of the actual animal or a hermit crab. I just see a shell. But maybe you'll get a little bit closer than me. Yeah, so if you see it must be quite a large gastropod. Do you know roughly how big that would be from point to point? Um, probably about the length of my palm from fingertip to wrist. So maybe 12 centimetres? Yeah, it's a little bit bigger than the palm of my hand. Yeah. You can see it's got a very distinctive kind of star shape there as well. So that might help in identification. Yeah, it's just really random. It's just a beautiful rope sponge here. And there's just like a shell in the middle. But Emil has changed angles. So you will all get a much better view of the opening and be able to tell if there's a live animal inside or whether it's just an empty shell. It does look to be an empty shell, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. So it doesn't appear to be any living organism there. So with, that's just a dead shell. So we won't worry about IDing that one. Yeah, uh, we'll move on from that one. It was just, it was just a bit random. The topography over the left side just always strikes me as how different it is from the right side. It's like you've gone into a different world, but it is still part of the same Catalina Reef. This side definitely has a lot more gorgonians, which are these feathery looking fan things that you can probably see, and Pat can definitely give you more information on them. Yeah, most definitely. So gorgonians are quite interesting corals. They are um, octocorals. Uh, so we have hexacorals, which are the stony corals, and then octocorals, which include the gorgonians. And we can tell this difference by looking the amount of the amount of tentacles on the polyps. So the polyps from an octocoral will have eight uh, tentacles or a set of eight. So it could be uh, it could be multiples of eight where they have a few rings around it. And then the hexacorals will have only six uh, tentacles on their polyps. And we can also look close up at the tentacles here and notice that they have little projections coming off them and they are called pinules and are another key identification feature in the Gorgonian. Now underneath this skeleton, I mean sorry, underneath these polyps are uh, its skeleton which is an axial rod that runs kind of through the Gorgonian which what gives it that uh, kind of tree or branch structure because it's all based on thick rods. Now this rod is not only made of calcium carbonate but a lot of different proteins as well. So this really gives it that flexible structure that allows it to kind of sway back and forward really gently in the current there. Now the last kind of component to a Gorgonian is what's surrounding this axial skeleton and keeping everything together, which is called the Cohenen chime. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, there's no real need to remember it, just know its function. It actually connects all of the polyps almost like a really primitive vascular system. So we don't see this in stony corals. In stony corals, all of the polyps are individual and won't really uh, have any form of connection apart from the skeleton, whereas the colon enzyme will connect all of these polyps and kind of distribute uh, nutrients and water between them. <laughs> Thanks for that, Pat. That was a lot of information. <laughs> just 
definitely coming up shallower. Not a little of six standard time that I'm here with you. And hopefully find some more exciting things. My mask has been very naughty these days and has fogged, so I have vision of one eye only. So hopefully Emil's eagle eyes are on point. Yeah, and I'll, I'll try and point out anything I do see on the screen here as well. Yes, I don't know why it's misbehaving, but it is. Uh, so Proud Cat Mama is asking, how do sea fans reproduce? Over to you, Pat. <laughs> so, sea fans uh, are Gorgonians, just like what we're looking at, and they reproduce in two ways. So, to add to their colony or to the entire kind of plant like structure that you do see, they uh, will reproduce asexually. And this is by budding or fission, which is when the polyp will kind of split off into another one and that new one will grow as well. So, this adds to the colony. But they can also reproduce sexually by releasing gametes, which is sperm and egg, into the water. And they will come together, form a zygote, which will develop into a larva, a planular larvae, which will then settle and then start to reproduce asexually and create another colony. Yeah, and that's pretty uniform for all corals. Oh, we have a little juvenile spotty drum down here. It's quite exposed and out in the open, which is unusual. Normally these guys hide a little bit more. Oh, oh wow. It's tiny, yeah. <laughs> oh, how cute. And we know it's definitely a juvenile because of its body shape and body form. As an adult, it does look completely different from this. It is worth looking up if you get the chance. So this is a spotty drum. It can often be mistaken for the jackknife. I think we all got it wrong at first as well. Red and beautiful as a juvenile with the elongated top and bottom fins. You can see them sort of swaying about there in the water. But as an adult, it does lose these. It loses these fins and there becomes more spots on the body, which is obviously where the name the spotty drum comes from. And it sort, it sort of loses that intensity of the black and white contrast. So as an adult, it's completely different. I don't actually think we've spotted an adult. Oh, we did once. Once. Yes. But as a juvenile, it's very, very, very small, only a couple of centimeters long. And it just swims in continuous circles. They are nocturnal, so during the day they normally hide out, although this one is quite exposed. And they just swim round and round and round and round, just almost hypnotizing to watch these guys. Yeah, it really is. They remind me a lot of uh, the ribbon dancers in the Olympics uh, in the gymnastics. It's uh, almost hypnotizing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they're lovely. They're really, really cute little fish. And no wonder this isn't an angel fish, it is a spotted drum. Yes, part of the drum family. But I can see exactly why you did think it could be an angel fish, but it's not. There is so many Sergeant Major's garden egg patches down here. I can literally see one, two, three. There's a lot of Sergeant Major's here. And this one, this patch here, there was actually two Sergeant Majors the Peard Garden over this nest, which is bright purple. Can't miss it. But one just got chased off. Hmm, there's a little bit of a dispute there, I think. And you can see the fish is doing something really strange. It sort of goes on to its side and does really fast wriggling motion. And it's trying to aerate the eggs. So not only is he guarding them, he's trying to push water over them in order to oxygenate them. So these damselfish, sergeant majors are damselfish, are very, very territorial and protective over the egg patches. And I'm sure Emile's got you nice and close, but the egg patch is actually really large. 
it must be about the size of a sort of small dinner plate here and he just will guard them continuously and fight away predators who come to try and eat them for about five to six days until they hatch. Are you able to see this funny body movement he's doing? Yeah, we're getting some great views of it. So it's almost like a little routine he's got going on there. He comes down, fans the eggs, and then goes up to check for any danger, and then comes back down and fans the eggs, and then whoop, and then chases something away. Yeah, and he would just continue doing that. So when I first approached this, there was actually two sergeant majors. So I think that the other one was maybe just coming along to sort of interfere and it did get chased away. So it must be really exhausting for this little guy to continuously do this all day. Now, uh, CJ has a pretty interesting question that I honestly don't know the answer to. I hope that you do, Lauren. Uh, she, she's asking, do they feed during these five to six days of, of the copulation? Yeah, they do. Sergeant Majors do. They do feed, but they normally just sort of pluck little bits of plankton from the water. And there's a lot of plankton in the water column right now, so they come a little bit higher up from the egg patch, but never too far. They will always have a sort of visual on the eggs, and they will feed. But their main priority during these days is to guard the eggs. And Betty wants to know, would they lay their eggs near one another? Well, I wonder if we can show you this. Okay, yeah, so Emil literally just swung from one egg patch to the other, so I'm not sure if you're able to see how close that was, but it's very close. I would say it's just maybe about two meters apart from one another, so under six foot. There's one huge egg patch with one Sergeant Major guard in it, and then literally right next door there's another one, and behind us there's another one, so I would say that's pretty close, would you? Yeah, definitely, we did get a good shot of how close that is, and it actually makes me wonder why they do this, because quite often we will see clusters of nests, so just like we're seeing here, a few within a relatively small space, and like, You'd think that they would want to put their eggs apart from one another, but yeah, there's obviously some sort of reason why they must do it close together. Yeah, I mean, they are obviously apart, but it's, it's really not by that much, so they mustn't be in sort of direct or even indirect competition with one another. Because they are the same species, it must be a good idea to have maybe the egg patches in the similar area so that they can all defend together. And so Marcy wants to know, would anything eat the Sergeant Major's eggs? Oh yes, yes. A lot of big fish would come along and nibble on the eggs. In fact, fish eggs in general are a very popular snack, so even plankton contains a lot of fish eggs. Obviously, we can't see them, but that's part of what makes up plankton. And yes, a lot of the bigger fish would come along and eat those Sergeant Major eggs. Yeah, and that is because eggs do contain a lot of the nutrients needed for life. So that is actually what is sustaining the embryos inside the egg. So you can imagine how many different types of vitamins and nutrients would be inside of an egg. And just to my right here is a, another egg patch. So they're literally everywhere and they are in the same sort of area. Yeah, I wonder exactly why that is. This must be the sort of Sergeant Major territory, and they must feel that this particular area with lots of sand patches is perfect for protecting their eggs. And my mum's chimed in with a question here, so hello Susan, she wants Hi, to know, uh, what would happen to the eggs if they weren't oxygenated? Um, I think they would die, it's completely compulsory for these fish to oxygenate them. 
but I don't know, maybe you know more of Pat? Yeah, well, yeah, you, you are right. They would not survive, so they would start to be overgrown by algae and smothered, and then uh, they would, yeah, not get the oxygen supplies they need and pass away. So the, uh, the nest itself would become kind of a dead zone, so to speak, in that there would not be much oxygen in that actual area. Yes, it's crucial for the life of the sergeant majors that they oxygenate their egg patches. Now, I just find it so, you know, the egg patch is a great part of they're so obvious. I mean, whenever me and Emil swim over them, they're just, you know, they stand out a mile away. And I often wonder, would they all stand out to predators as well? Yeah, yeah, that is a bit curious, isn't it? So my foggy mask is getting worse, so I'm doing my best to have a look at what is around me with the limited vision that I have. But we are going to go just shallower and see if we can find anything on this sort of hard pad reef crest area. Yeah, so while we are having a quick look around, can you just give us a little air update there, Lauren? Yeah, of course. So I have 100 bar. Perfect. So still a little bit of time left down here. Yeah, there's not too much going on in the reef this morning. But we're still just having a look. So it looks like we have a big urchin here in front of us. All of those spines there protruding out of that section in the rock. That is one single organism, a sea urchin. And it's actually moving its spines around as well. Yeah, it's moving its spine. So that looks like the long spine urchin, which is also known as Diatema antelarum. And believe it or not, this is actually a real keystone species around here in the Caribbean region. So you aren't really fully able to see the whole animal, but they are just a globular animal with these sharp spines completely covering it. So you would think that it is really protected and of course it's in that little hole in the reef. So it's definitely protected. But these animals are real strong herbivores. So they graze on all the algae. And this may be not sun crew important, but it really is. In Jamaica, there was a huge diadema die-off. So for some reason, they believe it was disease. It wiped out all of these long spine, um, long spine, sorry, urchins. And they reduced the population to around 2%. So the, what actually happened was nothing was grazing on this particular algae and it completely smothered all the reef, killing all the corals. And it had such a detrimental effect that the areas in Jamaica still haven't really recovered from that. So these urchins may not look much, but they play an integral role in the ecosystem. Yeah, most definitely. Everything needs to be in that perfect balance. And how they actually feed on this algae is quite interesting as well. They have a little uh, complex inside of them called Aristotle's Lantern because it is shaped kind of like a lantern. And it's essentially like a box sort of with uh, two hinges or jaws that come down and will actually protrude down and then uh, scrape algae off the rock and bring it back up. Yeah, they're fascinating. And sea urchins are actually in the same grouping as sea cucumbers and sea stars. They are echinoderms. So Proud Cat Mama wants to know, are their spines poisonous? No, they're not poisonous, but they would deliver a lot of damage just by being a spiky spine themselves. It is quite common for surfers and snorkelers and even divers to have to go to hospital to get these spines removed, especially from their bottom, if they've accidentally sat on one. But no, they're not poisonous. Yeah, and they are very brittle as well, so they're super hard to get out as well. <laughs> yeah, that's why most people go to the hospital if you try and get them out. 
yourself, it can end up just breaking apart in your hand. So it's better to get a professional to remove them with the correct tools. Now, Lauren, that urchin, uh, the spines on it were banded. Would you like me to try and identify it, or do you know the species? Um, I can really not see very much, yeah. um, so I, I won't be any help in identification or explanation. No, that's alright. I'll try and uh, look it up because it did have these really interesting bands on its spines. Sure, yeah, you can let us know. So the first one was definitely the long spine one, but this one, I really, I'm not sure. So, I've just got the urchins up now, and, oh, here we go. So, it appears to be the Magnificent Urchin. Uh, the Magnificent Urchin. So, oh, wow, what a name. Yeah, Astro, Astropyga Magnifica, so it's not in the same uh, genus as Diadema. Well, if anyone is keeping a species list that extends out with fish, that's another one for it. Yeah. So before we actually started the dive today, I did jump into the little harbour to have a look because I am so eager to show you all an octopus. And there is rumours that an octopus does live in the little harbour, so I did try, but unfortunately to no avail. So we will have a look in the hard pan area. This is a sort of perfect habitat for octopus to live. Um, so Gail has just told us that she also in the Bahamas had an excessive die-off of diadema. But she said that the numbers over there are also starting to repopulate as well. So that's really good to see. Yeah, I do think it was quite a Caribbean-wide thing that did happen with the diadema. They really don't know exactly what killed them off. So yeah, I, I imagine it would have affected the Bahamas as well. And it's taken a long time for these reefs and the diadema populations to recover. So it looks like you've come quite shallow now in reaching the hard pan. What is your depth, Lauren? And it's 6.7 metres, so we have came a little bit shallow. There wasn't too much happening below. So maybe if we try and look out for some fish to identify. Yeah, I would still love that juvenile angelfish. <laughs> Yeah, I know, me too. We, I did actually see a species that we've never identified or spoken about on the swim over here. So it would be ideal to bump into that one again. Oh, do you know sort of what type it was at least? Um, I think it looked like a porgy. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, we would definitely need to make a proper identification. I had a really sharp forked tail, but we have definitely never spoken about it or shown you it before. So fingers crossed we can bump into it again on this swim. Well, I think I know what one you're talking about as well, This the Majora, I think it may be. Oh, man, that would be great to show everyone. Okay, I'll keep my remaining eye open for it. <laughs> There's a lot of flamingo tongues in this area. A lot, a lot. Neil, let's take a look at this little. This one is very, very, very small. And it's got a beautiful pattern. And it's on a Gorgonian as usual. We always find the flamingo tongues munching away on the Gorgonians. So this one is smaller than the normal ones, but they really don't get that big. And flamingo, oh, we have two here. They're everywhere. This is a bit more normal. These ones are a little bit bigger, and you do tend to find them in male and female pairs. So I can't tell which, but one of these will be male and one will be female. And they are in the false cowrie grouping of sea snails. And they're named flamingo tongue 
does come from, I think it's just the elaborate nature of their pattern. I did research this because they don't resemble a flamingo and they don't resemble a tongue. So where does that name come from? And what we can see, these little orange spots are glorious to look at. And they're often mistaken by people that it is the shell that has this pattern. But it's not. The shell itself is pure translucent white. There's no pattern whatsoever. That is actually the animal inside the living tissue of the mantle that is creating this pattern. So if you were to remove the shell from the ocean, the animal would naturally die and the pattern would just completely disappear. And the pattern is really there to advertise to other animals, hey, don't eat me, I'm poisonous, stay away. In the ocean, if you are toxic or you are venomous or poisonous, you have to advertise it or else how would anyone know? So that's the purpose of these beautiful orange spots. But they are the favourite snack of our giant hogfish that we see regularly. So they love munching away on the flamingo tongues. And we can see there that's uh, pretty heavily fed upon those gorgonium polyps. We can see that there's quite a few missing now. And uh, they will actually incorporate the toxins from the gorgonium into their own tissues. And so that acts as a chemical defense. It is, it's incredible. So if they were to overpopulate and the populations were to continue to increase unsustainably so, they would actually have a real detrimental effect on the Gorgonians themselves. So luckily the populations are in check and the Gorgonians are known to recover from the damage in time. But if they were to go out of control, and then it would affect the Gorgonian populations. Yeah, and they've actually done studies on this that um, have shown they can't really explain where the link comes from, but when large predators were excluded from the ecosystems, it was the flamingo tongues numbers that increased and therefore the Gorgonians numbers decrease. So it really does highlight the importance of keeping all the large predators alive in an ecosystem. on the hard pan now. I actually love diving on this. This is where you find the, the real juveniles, the teeny tiny juvenile fish and all the interesting creatures hiding out on the hard pan. Yeah, it's quite a different habitat to the coral reef. But it's kind of almost like a, a uh, learning ground for a lot of species who will spend a lot of their juvenile years on the hard pan or in and around the uh, iron shore. And then as they get older, they will start to move out onto the reefs. I have seen a lot of brain corals in the hard pan that seem to be suffering from black band disease. So this is slightly worrying. And I am just looking out this now. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. But I've seen a lot now. So on our little swim over here, I'm going to try and point out to you black band disease for these brain corals. That's actually really fitting, Lauren, because Gail asked a few minutes ago whether we actually get coral diseases here. Yeah, well... I knew, I knew you just asked that. Yeah, unfortunately we do. We don't see much signs of bleaching here. Although we have spotted some the other day, but on a general scale, it's not much. But there is signs of coral disease. And actually, the other day, Pat found a sponge that was showing signs of sponge disease. And I did go back and check all this out, and it's true, the sponge, there is a disease which is attacking sponges now, particularly the rope sponge. So that is obviously separate, but coral disease is very worrying. It wasn't present until the sort of late 80s, early 90s, and we do believe that it is human-induced. All these diseases are becoming more and more prevalent and widespread due to human influences. So 
It is another worrying factor for coral reefs worldwide. But the disease that I can see here the most is definitely the black band disease. So we will do our best to find a colony and point it out to you. Yeah, most definitely. So, Marcy was asking, you did partially answer this question, uh, what causes black band disease? So, it is uh, thought to be human-induced. Yeah, there, there's a huge wide range of them. There's the white plague, the black band, the white band, and there's different diseases that target different corals. There's, a, there's an ever-growing list of diseases. But yeah, like I mentioned, the one I am seeing is a black band. Yeah, and quite often, when, if you were to observe the black banded area affected by the disease, you'll notice that there'll be quite a lot of other organisms that are taking advantage of the dying coral tissue. So it's really hard to put it down to one cause because there is all these different parasites on the black band. Yeah, and studies are showing that the diseases are spreading very quickly. So, if there is a lot of brain corals in the one area, it will heavily affect them all, most likely. And now that I've mentioned that, we're probably not going to see any, but <laughs> I am definitely going to look out for them because it's very interesting to show you exactly what this looks like. Yeah, I know that near the first boat on the left, uh, there is a brain coral with quite badly affected... Yeah, I know the one you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. I was actually hoping to show everyone one more time what we call, well, we call it the yellow ray, but I think a lot of local people here call it the lemon ray, so it's the same thing. And it's just a very, very, very small stingray that is often found in this area. So I was hoping to come across that as well, but I have spotted the brain coral with the disease. So me and a, oh, there's actually two. Oh, three. Okay. Yeah, this is not so good. I think we're going to go over to this one, Emil, because it's much bigger. Yeah, so it's very prevalent in this area of the reef, unfortunately. And it does target the sort of bolder brain coral species. Oh, this is really interesting. Okay, what a great find. So we have two separate coral colonies here, and they're not the same species. One looks like Deploria, I'm not sure about the other one, but these are not the same, so you can see the two mounds here. The one on the left is perfectly ha um, healthy. There is no signs of disease on this one, and no sign of any real damage. They're approximately both the same size, however, if you look at the one on the right, at the bottom, it's a sort of purpley, palish colour. That's the healthy part. That part of this coral is still alive. And then as you go up a little bit, there is a band. A really, really dark band separa separating it from the white tissue. Now this is what we call the black band disease. At the top, it's dead. It's completely dead. And that band of whitish corals is dying. It's in the process of dying, but it's not quite dead yet. So this black band would have started at the top of the coral and it is slowly making its way down to the base. So I would estimate very, very shortly this whole colony will be dead. And it's just amazing that it is right next door to a perfectly healthy, thriving colony. Are you getting a good visual on this path? Yeah, it's great to see that contrast there. It's really good. And it's really demonstrating as well how the black band works. It will... It would have started as just a black spot on the top of the coral, and as it slowly moves out, it almost is like anima a slow motion animation. Where it moves out, the white will start to spread behind the band, and the, the healthy tissue will start to decay. Yeah, it's really sad. And right where we are right now, I can see at least three green corals that have got black band disease. So 
this unfortunately is not a good prospect for the leaves here. No, not at all. And we have a question about black band disease that comes from... Sorry, I have lost it. Here. Um... Uh, so I, I I lost the the person who asked the question, but someone wanted to know how uh, whether it can be recovered, uh, whether there's any cure or treatment that can be given. No, unfortunately. So as you're looking at this one right now, most of it on top side is dead. So I do believe the disease can be healthy, but the coral cannot recover. <laughs> So when we refer to coral bleaching, that's not a disease or anything like that. That's just when the coral is in a stress state and it can recover. But this is a different situation and it is literally killing the coral. And therefore, that colony itself will not recover. Mm. It is a bit unfortunate. And Sophie wants to know, can the disease transfer, transfer to the coral that's touching it? That's actually what I was just thinking. I do believe black band disease, you might have to correct me here, Pat, is quite species specific. Yeah, definitely, so definitely. I, the, the, the species next to it, I'm sure it's a diploria, is um, not the same. So it's come two different species here on each mound. And so far it's completely unaffected and I actually don't think it's going to spread to the next door colony. I'm sure it's a species-specific disease, but Pat might have to check on that just to confirm. No, you. I mean, I will double check that, but you are correct. Um, they, it is very specific to to one or two species, yeah. and it, that's the same with a lot of coral diseases, actually. Yeah, and there's a specific disease that only attacks the Acropora species that we regularly show you, and so there's lots of diseases that are quite species-specific. So yeah, that was not the most <laughs> happiest thing to show you, but Emil has also just gone over another colony showing black band disease. So unfortunately, there's a lot here and it's going to keep on spreading. So this is just another example, I guess, of how we are affecting and impacting the coral reefs. Yeah, it is unfortunate to see, but it also is really important. So just over here, there's more colonies of black band disease, which is quite interesting because obviously we swam over to the left today, but generally we tend to swim over to the right, and we don't see it so much over there. So the disease seems to be localized in this area for this part of the reef, but it will continue to spread. <laughs> It's unfortunate. So, Lauren, we have Timothy asking, can we do another air check? Yep, I have 60 bars, so I'm at the last part of the dive. So, 60 bars, and we are really in the shallows now. So, send in any questions you have. We'll try and answer them before we wrap up. It's been a lovely, relaxing, chilled dive. Especially in honour of the Mangrove Day, we were considering doing a dive in the mangroves for you, but we aren't quite set up to do that, but it would have been interesting. So just ahead of me right now is, is another, another colony of black band disease. So it's just shown you we've just travelled maybe about 10 metres, and here we have another colony affected. Wow, the numbers definitely do seem to be increasing since when we first came here. Yeah, I do feel that as well. This, so I'll try and get closer without touching. So just to be clear on what I was trying to explain earlier, this is the healthy part of the coral. This is also very much alive. This band is how we know it is black band disease. Now this white segment isn't quite dead yet. It's in the process of dying. It is technically bleached. And this sort of upper part, which looks a bit fluffy and hairy, is completely dead. And it's covered in algae. Algae has just taken that chance and started to smother the coral. So yes, that is how it works. 
here is slowly and slowly the black band is moving down, causing the whole colony to die. Yeah, and we can see on the, the white, the really affected area, that it is starting to be overgrown there by algae as well. Yeah, but to be honest, we've actually never spoke about coral disease much on any live dive. So yeah. that's been really interesting just to point that out and highlight it to everybody. A lot of people are not aware that corals are dying by disease in our oceans. Is there any last minute questions, Pat? Um, yeah, sure. So Spass is asking, how do we know if a coral is healthy? How do we know if it's healthy? Yeah. Um, I kind of just showed that. There's, the main thing is the colour difference. It is quite obvious when a coral is dead. Um, it will start to erode, break down, and algae will cover it. So normally it's covered in a sort of hairy, filamentous algae. Coral that's alive is very, it's a lot more colourful. And coral that is bleached is obviously pure white. So to the naked eye, sort of the first thing that you would notice is a colour difference. And just before we wrap up, so Ashley has just uh, only recently joined us and wants to know where we are actually diving. Where are we diving? Yeah. Well, we are on the western side of Grand Cayman, right out front of the awesome dive centre, Don Foster's Dive Centre on Casalina Point. So it's a very long reef and kind of how it works in the Grand Cayman is that the reef extends the whole length just wondering what was inside of there, sorry. The reef extends the whole length of the island, so it is just really one reef, but there's sort of different names for each part of it in order to make it easier for divers. So we are at Casarina Point. So on that note, I have hit 50 bars, so this is the point where we do wrap up the dive. So I have been pretty shallow, I've actually already done my safety stop, I'm moving safety stop. But thank you for joining, I thoroughly enjoyed that relaxing dive and Pat will be down with you at 11am. So please join us because our the remaining number of broadcasts we have are limited and we want to make the most of them all with you. So thank you for all your support and we will see you at 11. Thank you guys, I can't wait to dive with you all at 11am.